please find a comfortable place to sit. Place your hands on your legs. Close your eyes or keep a soft focus on the screen. Take a deep breath in and out. A deep breath in and out. Continue to breathe deeply and slowly. Feel relaxation flowing down from your head into your neck, into your shoulders, down your arms, and into your hands and your fingers. Relax down into your chest, into your stomach, and down your legs, into your feet. Continue to breathe deeply and slowly. Okay. Welcome to the 10th lecture of my happiness class. We turn from external sources of happiness to internal sources. All feelings, other than those involving nerve endings, are determined internally. They are determined by the mind. I stress this repeatedly because if you're going to truly be successful in your pursuit of happiness, you can't just have an external pursuit. You're going to have to do something about the mind. You're going to have to learn something about mind training. So I stress this once again. When we experience something externally, we judge it. That creates the feelings. Our judgments of external stimuli create feelings. And understanding that, that our judgments of what is happening now is going to involve how we judge. And the key here is changing the lens of judgment, of how we judge what is happening now, or learning how to not to judge, period. So when we're experiencing something directly in the now, the key is the lens that we use for interpretation. 
most of our feelings, though, are not, ge are not generated by what is happening now. Our judgments of, of direct experience are actually a small part of where our feelings come from. Because our mind usually isn't in the now. Our thoughts about the past, about the future, our imaginings and ponderings are most of what we do with the mind. So we're not here now. Most of our feelings are being generated by our thoughts, by thinking about the past or future, imaginings, pondering problems, all these activities, which is the large majority of how we spend our time in our mind, are where most of our feelings come from. Most of our thoughts aren't, exact, aren't about now. They're past, future, imaginings, and ponderings about some abstract thing that we're, we're thinking about. So, here, understanding this, is this where most of our feelings are coming from? The judging not of what's happening now, but what's happening in our minds. The thoughts that are keep running without apparently any more much control, that should be the focus of where we're going to look for finding happiness within, to feel better within. And here, thought management is the key. I also stressed that some feelings love, joy, peace, may be inherent in us, that we don't cause them by our judgments and thoughts, that our judgments and thoughts can only interfere with our experience of them. But this is the idea that some feelings are inherent to our being and are not caused. So the general rule, then, is negative thoughts, negative judgments, negative feelings. Positive thoughts, more positive feelings. That's the general rule. Negative judgments, of course, are, are inherent to any irritation, displeasure, anger, fear, resentment, feeling superior. They are the proximate cause, if you will, of relatively unpleasant feelings. Positive judgments would include things like appreciating something or someone, just enjoying things. I talked about appreciation as being love. But gratitude, acceptance, uh, uh, forgiveness, all these types of, of judgments, if you will, or ways of, let's say, using the mind in a positive way have far more positive feelings associated with them. In this way, you may say that the tone of our thoughts, positive or negative, is instant karma. In other words, we immediately reap the reward, if you will, for negative thoughts, the punishment. We immediately get our negative feelings for our negative judgments. And, vice versa, we immediately reap the positive rewards of our positive judgments, our positive thoughts, or non-judgment. So, you, we can see this as uh, true justice. Negative thoughts, judgments, negative feelings, positive thoughts and judgments, positive feelings. Instant karma. 
I should also address a major problem here with, with our thoughts and judgments and our feelings is that it isn't just a matter of a single judgment because we get into feedback loops. A negative thought or judgment, a negative feeling, which then leads to another negative thought and judgment and more negative feelings. So it becomes a feedback loop of thoughts and feelings that keep reproducing itself and difficult to get out of. This is what is associated with depression, is you can't seem to break out of this feedback loop of negativity. It seems to lock you into it. So, these ideas of, let's say, of thoughts and, and feelings reproducing themselves it is a serious matter in understanding what we can do to break out of negativity and into positivity. One of the problems is, is that 90% of our thoughts are negative. Breaking out of that is going to take some real mind training. If we can break out of it, and this is something that therapists, therapists use as a major therapy is teaching clients, teaching, teaching patients how to gain some perspective and get some positive thoughts going and hope, hopefully break that feedback loop of negativity to somehow stop it for a while and hopefully teach them how to keep that positivity, to at least lessen the negativity for a while, and maybe learn how to create some positive feedback loops. That is a key therapy, as, as I said, is that breaking into the feedback loops. So, the means of, which we're going to get to later, of getting out of depression is going to be changing the negativity of the feedback loop into a positive one, which also feeds into itself if you let it. In the mat, in the moment of experiencing something and judging it, and then gaining the feeling from that judgment. One of the main means of being able to deal with that and feel better is how an immediate way that we're set to interpret. Attitude is a major means of creating a lens, if you will, that through which we judge for what's happening immediately. Attitude, of course, is a mindset where we're prone to either judge things negatively or positively. We talk about a good attitude and a bad attitude. And it is the lens of judgment in our minds. Attitude, therefore, is, is one of the uh, things that we would work on to be able to get more positive feelings. Changing the tone of our attitude. Negative attitude, you're always seeing something wrong with what's happening with people, with things and circumstances. And you're prone to do that. You can see some people are always judging. Everything is bad and rotten and out to get them. And that's their automatic response to things. Positive attitude is, you know, kind of the habit of enjoying what is, of looking on the bright side of things, of uh, giving people and circumstances a break, and as a, an outlook, if you will, 
a lens through which you're going to look at the world and judge it in a more positive way. So attitude is important. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to the means of happiness. Question is, how can you change your attitude? Because this has to be a practical means of feeling better. Well, how do you do it? And I will address this more when I get into the internal means of happiness. But right now, I'll just mention things like being able to see um, the humorous in things. Life is so absurd in many, many ways, and learning how to laugh at it is developing a positive attitude. And also, of course, being able to get the larger perspective, to stand back and the mountain that, of your problem that was looming before you then turns into a, a molehill. So gaining a perspective, or learning how to do that somewhat more automatically, I'm, I'm feeling bad, let me see the bigger picture here, that does change things. And it changes the negative viewpoint of your immediate problem into a larger sense of everything ultimately is okay. This is a small problem. Everything else is, is good. Also, this whole habit of the automatic judgment, and we are really tough on ourselves. We judge ourselves negatively all the time. And one of the means of breaking into that is what is called the angel's advocate. Always give yourself a break. At least have your internal lawyer, if you will, be the angel that's going to be saying, ah, oh, you know, that wasn't so bad that you're making a, a big deal out of this. You know, you're a really good person anyway. So changing that internal judge or, or advocate, if you will. And, of course, just cultivating appreciation of things. Learning how to uh, smell the roses and enjoy things, you know, uh, practicing gratitude. And this is something you can practice and learn how to do more and more often. And you, what you will find is, is that it makes you feel better. Forgiveness, self-esteem, these are all way, ways of changing the lens of judgment. And therefore changing what we feel. A major source of our judgments and outlook, and therefore of our internal source of feelings, are our beliefs, what we believe. This is so more difficult to address because we always think that what we believe is, is you know, in, in the reality of things. But actually, there's reason to doubt, um, which is good because that means if we can change our beliefs, we can change how we feel. Now, I'm going to quote out of my book here. Beliefs serve as interpretive filters of perception, and they can offer inner solace amidst the troubles of life, or deny it, can provide meaning, or obscure it, can blunt the edges of circumstances or sharpen them. And the types of beliefs with a major impact on how we feel are one, what we believe about the nature of reality, about what we believe we really are and what our ultimate fate is, whether we actually have some choice in those matters depends on what we believe about the nature of reality. And of course, people will say, you know, I, I, I see reality here. How am I going to change my belief about it? Actually, nobody perceives reality directly. I mean, you, you, if you believe in, in materialism and, and everything is just coming out of a brain in a physical universe, our perceptions are creating our experience of it. 
They're creating it. The outside world isn't. And because of how we interpret everything, we are really experiencing our own state of mind, not directly reality. Physics will teach you that. Especially quantum physics will teach you that. So, can we change your mind about reality? Yeah, actually, the more you explore the whole concept of reality, you can. Of course, some people already have put a positive belief about reality, believing that ultimately all is good, heaven awaits, and what we see, our experience of what we see can be changed. A very important belief is our belief about human nature. And especially our belief about whether people are mostly good or mostly bad. Many people see others, other people, as mostly selfish. And their feelings about people, therefore, are really colored by that perspective. People are selfish. You got to watch out for them. Uh, they're always looking out for themselves, not for me. If they're trying to sell me something, it's for them, for their gain and not my gain. I always have to be suspicious uh, because people are selfish. They're bad. They're sinners, etc. If you believe people are mostly good, that they mostly have compassion, that they are friendly when they, and kind most of the time, that that's their basic nature. Of course, they may be different in certain circumstances, but mainly people are good. Uh, mainly people are cooperative. Mainly people are kind when they can be in the situations that allow that. If that's what you believe, you're going to see it. You're going to see the evidence of that because that belief will be sustained by what you focus on. And it's the same thing if you believe people are inherently selfish. You will see that too. What you focus on is going to color your perception of reality. So what you believe about people is a very important belief for how you feel and how you're going to interact with people. And if you're going to mostly fear them or mostly enjoy them. So that belief is a big one. Of course, what you believe about the purpose of life is important because here we're talking, once again, about our fate. Now, this purpose in life, what we choose to pursue in our lives, what we think is, is important, but the idea of the purpose of life is the purpose of why we're here. Is there a purpose for us being here, for our short time on earth? Well, what you believe there can obviously affect how you feel. Another important belief is about the good. The good with a capital G. This is a concept that the ancient Greeks talked about, especially Plato, the good. The good is what is inherently moral, what is inherently good in, in existence. And for Plato, there was the good existed, it existed permanently, and everything that we saw that wasn't good was an illusion. So the, what you believe about the good is important because what you're going to choose to see, what you're going to choose to see as your goals in life, 
whether you're going to act according to your concept of the good, the moral, which you think is as part of your higher purpose. That is obviously going to affect how you feel. Now, if you have an idea of the good and you're not living according to that, well, that comes with the icky feeling called guilt. But if you feel like you're living according to your concept of the good with a capital G, you get a normative satisfaction out of that. It's called normative satisfaction because uh, you're getting satisfaction out of living with your ideas about what is good and right. Having a sense of purpose has been shown in the research to be very important to one's happiness, to what one feels. Having a sense of purpose is important in many ways. A clear sense of purpose, you know what it is you're looking for, not, uh, not just in the moment, of course, but we're here, we are also talking about the long term. But purpose gives us a sense of meaning. We interpret what happens according to what our purpose is. We, we judge things whether they're somehow hindering our purpose or helping our purpose. So it becomes a means of how we give meaning to things. Our sense of purpose is a means of inter interpreting what is happening in terms of whether it serves or hinders that purpose. Also, when you have clarity, clarity of a goal and direction, at that helps get rid of a lot of the conflicts in our minds. So often, what you will find is, is that people have different purposes that are in conflict with each other. At some level of mind, that's going to cause some anxiety and pain. This constant conflict of our, of our purposes. If you have clarity of purpose, you reduce that conflict, reduce that anxiety and pain, and feel better. So, having clarity is of, of your goal and the direction you're going is important. And having clarity about what you really want also gives you a measure. I have this destination out here. Am I getting closer or not? A measure of progress. For example, if my goal is to get to Seattle, I can measure how close I'm getting. And when you have a clarity of goal, then it gives you that sense of direction. Am I heading in the right direction or not? And you don't have that if you don't have a sense of purpose. It's, you don't feel progress because you don't have a goal that you would progress towards. And feeling progress is something you gain from having a clear goal in life, having a purpose in life. And as I said, is that when you have this clear goal and you see it as a higher purpose, a moral purpose, and you live your life mostly in accordance with achieving that goal, you get normative satisfaction. You feel good about yourself. The downside is, is when you have that goal and you don't live according to that goal. Guilt, once again. Also, having a sense of purpose that is, is clear and reducing the conflict can give you a sense of inner harmony. An inner harmony, because much of the confusion of life is somewhat gone when you know what you want and you can measure your progress towards it. 
an inner harmony because so many of the conflicts in your mind can be reduced because they are in harmony with your deepest goal and belief. A problem here is though, is that there are people with a very clear purpose and goal which involves hurting other people. They're in conflict with other people. This is the clarity of a fanatic who totally believing in, in, in uh, some purpose that involves hurting other people, taking away their freedom, and forcing them to march along with you. And if they don't, destroy them. A person with that type of purpose is not going to feel inner harmony. They can BS themselves, but a purpose that is in conflict with the purpose of others is not going to bring inner harmony. Something I would also say is important, when you realize that happiness is what you're after, you would give more thought and attention to the purpose of the heart. Understanding what you're looking for is a feeling or feelings. That means that many of the things that you see as important are going to have to be looked at through the purpose of the heart. You're going to have to become a lot more aware of feelings and what causes them. And this can change how you pursue happiness externally and internally. This is a quote out of my book. If the value of experience lies in feeling, the underlying purpose in all we pursue is determined by the heart. If you knew the deepest aspiration of the heart, you could consciously choose a purpose most likely to fulfill it. Let your heart be the guide. Let the mind, the reasoning mind, be the servant. This can change many things. It may not change your ultimate goal of happiness, because happiness, after all, is the goal of the heart, but it can certainly change how you pursue it and your probability of success. Now, Eckhart Tolle says, quote, not your aims or your actions are primary, but the state of consciousness out of which they come. In other words, all the things that, that we do, our, our actions, and many of the, the things that we would usually do to feel better aren't really all that important. It's our state of mind that determines whether we can experience the higher reaches of happiness. In other words, achieving that state of mind or being aware of it is the key means in the pursuit of happiness in this viewpoint. And as I said, that, that many believe, and there really a lot of growing evidence for this, that um, the consciousness is not being created by our brain, that there is a universal source, if you will, uh, with Eckhart Tolle, uh, a source with the capital S, and many, many people have actually claimed direct experience of this. I've talked about the peakers and others. So, this is not a, an idea that is just way out there. It's becoming more and more accepted, and more and more people are thinking that it's plausible. 
Actually, there was a time that most people did believe that consciousness was coming from somewhere else than, than the brain. Uh, Pre-science, actually. But in this belief, this essential nature of our being, our spirit, soul, etc., as I mentioned, is love, joy, and peace. And this is something that you can't create. This isn't something that you can feel by how you judge or not judge. They're saying that this is not something you can produce out of your mind. You can only be aware of it. You can only remove the barriers to being aware of it. And then love, joy, and peace naturally spring into our experience. So, how do you do this? How do you become more in touch with your state of being, if you will? The, what they call the natural mind before you start thinking and judging. Well, they say there's only one way. You're not creating it. You can only get rid of all the impediments to being aware of it. So the recommendation is find the stillness of mind. The stillness of mind where you stop thinking. The stillness of mind is the most conducive state to this because you have removed most of the impediments. Does this sound like uh, too far out there? I mean, how do you achieve this? Well, actually, the means for getting greater stillness of mind are being taught and they're being used in psychotherapy and there's great awareness of what you would do to practice what you might call the mind training. The mind training of finding stillness of mind. Today, everybody talks about mindfulness. Totally didn't talk about or use the word mindfulness, but what he was talking about is being in the now, and that is exactly what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is something that is being taught in schools and being taught in, in uh, businesses and practiced in many, many ways. It's become kind of the, the new buzzword. But mind, mindfulness is simply being there now, aware of now, without judgment. And I'm going to go deeper into this when we get into the internal means of happiness. So mindfulness and meditation. Actually, mindfulness is a form of active meditation, if you will, is that you don't just sit there, you are engaged in, in life, just becoming aware of it. Meditation goes deeper. You can find stillness deeper if you stop your activity and your mind then can slowly become more still, find more silence to the relax relaxation and constantly bringing the mind back into the now. So meditation goes deeper. But these two practices are key. And I, as I said, I'll go much further into this. But they're meant to find the stillness. Once you find the stillness, the love, joy, and peace take care of themselves. So my next lecture, I'm going to go into engagement. Engagement as a means of finding happiness in your external pursuits. How we, we, you can engage in the world in a way that is most likely to bring you closer to happiness. So in the meantime, may you find some stillness. Namaste.